Mr. Percy and the Prophet. A little novel by Wilkie Collins. Adapted for radio by John Arden. With Ronald Pickup as Wilkie Collins. At the beginning of the year 1817, an unusual advertisement appeared in the London newspapers. Many people read it. A surprisingly large number responded. It said, I have the honour of inviting to my house in Villa Street, adjacent to the Strand, any persons who may be interested in investigations, the object of which is to penetrate the secrets of the future. And that's the beginning of an altogether new story which I, Wilkie Collins, am about to have the honour to tell you. To be published, I hope, I hope, God help me, in 1887 when I shall be 63 and the events of the story exactly 70 years old. The advertisement had a second paragraph. I expect no preliminary fee. Ladies and gentlemen who see sufficient reason to trust me after personal experience will find a money box fixed to the waiting room table into which they may drop their offerings according to their means. At home every evening between the hours of six and seven, Jean-Jacques Legarde, physician. A good doctor, so they say, but he's quite without patronage. To keep himself alive in a strange land, he has had to become a species of mountebank prophet. Such a character would be well worth a three-volume novel. I can't cope with a whole novel at my time of life, so I'll call it a little novel and make sure to keep it short, make sure it's on the paper before my health breaks down completely. My unhappy little carcass is already half a corpse. Dead before my next birthday? Sixty-three? Why not? My father, the landscape painter, was only fifty-eight when he died, and he was a royal academician. He didn't die of my symptoms. I'll come back to my symptoms later. High time we should discover who it is who marches down Villa Street in answer to the advertisement. Left, right, left, right... 1817, two years after the end of that offence against Christianity which we call the Napoleonic War, and which brought the British people nothing but starvation and tyranny and frustrated revolution, this vigorous young gentleman is still in the army, a captain of artillery. And he really don't know why. The only fighting they're likely to want him to do will be against his own countrymen. His emotions are all tossed about. Oh, perhaps a clairvoyant will help him to settle them. Into the waiting room. Three gentlemen already there, sitting in a row, waiting in silence. An elderly manservant gives the captain a small card with a number on it. What's this for? The servant explains how each number will be called in order. Thereby, as he puts it, the doctor will be absolved from any dispute among his clients as to the priority of their consultation, he says. You see, sir, it is the well-proven practice in Paris. Paris, indeed. The captain has thoughts about Paris. Paris? Oh, good Lord. Some sort of emigre. Conceivably a dirty spy. What would be his attitude to a king's officer? Hmm? I'd better take care. Humbug! A florid young gentleman coming out from his interview with Dr Lagarde. I gather you were not impressed. <laughs> I'd had an hour or two to spare, so I applied to the fellow to tell me my fortune. Well, first he went to sleep over it, and then he said he could tell me nothing. I asked him why. I don't know, says he. <laughs> I do, says I. Humbug! At which point the servant calls out the next number, number 15, and nobody has it. The three gentlemen on the row of chairs are 16, 17, 18. And as for the artillery, Captain... Not me, I assure you. My card says 14. Which is utterly ridiculous, for 14 was the florid young man just about to go out through the door. Wait! cries the servant. Excuse me, sir, wait! Yes, 
Yes, all right. What a curious little problem. Perhaps the clairvoyant can solve it by clairvoyance. <laughs> ah, here he is. Uh, gentlemen, please, please, I must beg your indulgence. Uh, th there is confusion with the numbers. No uh, accident, uh, coincidence. <laughs> It may have a hidden meaning which would be most important to explore. I therefore would ask the three of you already waiting to wait a few moments longer while the gentleman with number 14 in point of fact in his hand should consult me out of his turn. And I would be most obliged if you, sir, dissatisfied as I know you are, Hmm. should consent to stay here for just a little longer. <laughs> Something quite remarkable might happen. Uh, you think so, Doctor, do you? I'll tell you what. I'll toss for it. Heads I stay, tails I go. Heads. Very good. Go on with your hocus-pocus. <laughs> I see you believe in chance. <laughs> Not my experience. No. A brief description of this soothsayer as he brings in the captain into his consulting room. Tall, dark, gaunt, prematurely aged, a visionary convinced of his own truth. If you please to take a seat, sir. <clears throat> you have come, I suppose, to look into the darkness which hides your future life. <laughs> but I am not, you understand, a fortune teller, a charlatan, a... Uh, <laughs> A quack, is it not, in English? Um, I know nothing about that. But there is a thing I want to know. I do need to know. I tell you, sir. Mother, are you ready? I am ready, Jean-Jacques. An elderly lady, all in black, half hidden in a dark corner of the room. Ah, uh, madame... Good evening. My mother, you see, has the inexplicable ability to throw me directly into the depths of magnetic trance. I take hold of my son's hands. I look into his eyes. Complete silence. We wait. Are you sleeping, Jean-Jacques? Yes, Mother, I am sleeping. And so we wait. So, hold one of his hands in yours and put to him what questions you please. Um, <clears throat> uh, I don't know quite how to begin, but... Um... Admit your true motive, your interest in your future life, is in fact most... Thoroughly confused, but at root it is your interest in a woman. You wish to know if her heart will be yours. I see the shapes of two people, one of them you, one of them a lady. All I can discern is that she is taller than women usually are, and that she is dressed in blue, in pale blue. Lord, but pale blue, it's, it's her favorite color. Now she is gone. I can only see you. You have a pistol in your hand. <gasps> ah, there is another man, and a pistol in his hand. Are you to fight a duel? Do you fight for the lady? This man, can you describe him? No. It is the mystery of the numbers on the cards. Please, mother, to ring the bell. All of the people who are waiting in the waiting room, call them in here. Each one of them to take one of my hands in turn while the captain holds the other hand. But there's only one gentleman left in the waiting room, and he... Oh. I was asked to stay. I stayed. I fell asleep. I've been woken up brusquely. A not, of course, mystical sleep, a common or garden slumber, quite against the rules. So, 
Is there something you'd wish me to do? Madame Lagarde explains to him. He's highly sceptical, but he sits. He puts his hand out to the doctor's hand and... Ah, now I know it. You who touched me, you are the man. In my vision I can see you plain, clear. You. Vision? What the deuce am I doing there? You stand against the other man, this man. Pistols, you stand, you will fight. Nonsense, we're total strangers. Unless, that is to say, you care to introduce us. You are Mr Percy Linwood. I have the honour to present to you Captain Burvey of the Artillery. It's a trick. <gasps> Good God, it's quite amazing. It's incredible. Devilish clever, though. Uh, clever? Did you say clever? No. I am persuaded Dr. Lagarde is possessed of scarce comprehensible powers. We make mock of them at our peril. Please, Mr. Uh, Linwood, will you hold his hand again? Doctor, you have described us about to fight a duel. So? So what happens? Do I kill him? No. Both of the duelists have faded from sight, but... Now I see a pathway in a garden. A man and a woman walk. They stop. He puts a ring upon her finger. He kisses her. Uh, kisses? Uh, ring? Yes. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. But who? Who is the happy man? You. Me? No. Not Captain Burvey, Mr. Linwood, yes. No, but it can't be. The woman, who's the woman? The same as before, dressed in pale blue. Only her dress? Is that all you can see of her? No, long, dark brown hair falling below her waist, dark brown eyes, very young, nervous, sensitive. And the man? It is this man. It is Linwood. You're sure of it? You're sure? Yes, I am sure. By God, sir, I've heard enough. Madame, my apologies, but wait, I... Wait, Burvey, wait. I cannot believe you believe this mumbo-jumbo, but supposing you do, let me state it as a fact that the description of the lady applies in no particular to anyone whom I know. That may be your present opinion, but what is to prevent you making further acquaintances? You, sir, have the future before you, whereas I have... Oh, no, oh, no, no, no. Percy Linwood is no longer amused. If this is an imposture, it is mischievous and hurtful. You have thoroughly distressed that gentleman. But, and... monsieur, I assure you... Of course you assure me, madame. And I have to test your assurances. Let me once again take hold of the hand of the prophet... Now, sir, the next discovery. What do you see? Nothing. Nothing. Or something, something for the money box. Well? Mother, does he mock at me? Wait, wait, for I do see indistinct. But the man, not him, the other man, kept in with him, the woman. Go away with me, he says. She does not want. He whispers, and they go, captain and woman, hand in hand. Dark. Nothing to see. Finished. Mr. Linwood, as he passes through the waiting room, does put some money in the box. Five pounds. These people, after all, he thinks are surprisingly poor and proud. He thinks they are probably sincere in their belief in... Belief in what? Their scientific demonstration? He himself don't believe a word of it. No, not at all. As he tells himself over and over, walking through the streets to his lodgings. No, nope, not a word. Four illustrations, but there isn't any text. This captain and I fight about a lady, perhaps. And then she marries me, perhaps. And in the end, runs off with him. But how? Why? 
We don't know. As a prophecy, useless. Couldn't induce anyone to modify his conduct, which is, as I suppose, the chief purpose of prophecy. No, it's not likely I'll run into him ever again. Nor that doctor, neither. There's an end to it. <laughs> an end? Oh, no. No point in writing tales about prophecies which don't come true. I'm entitled to grant my fictional soothsayer some limited visionary powers, why not? For I myself have visionary powers. They derive from the tincture of opium I drink for the agony of my unaccountable diseases. <laughs> oh, God, and I need some now. Agony. Rheumatic. Gout, the medical men call it nonsensical term in my legs, in my head, in my eyeballs. Ah, God, what have they done with the bottle? Ah. Yeah. Oh. Mm. Oh. Last night, do you know... I had a vision on the stairs of my house. This woman in the shadows of the first floor landing. She had green skin. She had tusks instead of teeth. And she tried to bite a piece out of my shoulder. I tell you, she was as real as the shoulder. So therefore, I insist that my Dr. Lagarde has a right to claim his visions, whether by drugs or by hypnotism, or maybe even the grace of God. But now the doctor's out of the story. Somebody else comes in, an old friend of Mr. Linwood's, member of the same club in Pall Mall. Major Mulvaney, retired, a boisterous, good-hearted, grey-haired relic of Wellington's victorious army. So I said to the fellow directly, you're endeavouring to entrap me into seditious political talk. <laughs> Waiter, fetch the menu. Yes. Do you suppose he was a spy? My dear Percy, what else? On the government bloody payroll. But don't say you heard it from me. The menu, sir. <clears throat> yes, I'll have some braised beef. What about you? you? I think I'd rather have... Do you this... know how to waltz? Uh, how to what? Waltz. I'm sure you do, frisky young fellow like you. The new German dance, you know. Bishops and all sorts are telling us it's filthy immoral. <laughs> well, it ain't, and tonight I'm insisting upon it. Oh, yes. Tonight? Y you did say the beef. Uh, actually, no, I wouldn't. Waiter, braised beef for the two of us. Four bottles of the usual claret. Yes. yes, yes, of course, tonight. The old regiment gives its annual ball. Woolwich, in the drill hall at the barracks. I've a ticket to spare, so of course you'll come, won't you? Well, I was really... Gather bothered, your man. rosebuds while you bay, Percy. I know several sweet girls who are going to be there, and Percy, <laughs> some of them waltz. <laughs> well, shall you come? Uh, will it? Well, why not? Splendid. Eight o'clock. I'll find the carriage. You pay for the post horses. Chance, perhaps? Destiny? Implausible coincidence? The very first person Mr. Linwood sets eyes on at the entrance to the ballroom is Captain Arthur Burvey. And Captain Burvey says, my God. My God. Mr. Linwood thinks, my God. My God, what to say to him? He's sure to believe I'm dogging him on purpose. You know each other, what? Uh, yes, Major, up to a point. I'll soon set that right. Both of you, my dear friends, Percy, Arthur, permit me I to... I beg you to excuse me. I'm a member of the committee charged with the arrangements of the ball, and I really must attend to my duties. What does he mean, his duties? He was hanging around in the portico. Waiting for somebody. Oh, yes, yes. Fact is, the man's in love. Madly in love, and mad is the absolute word. A girl called Charlotte Beaumont, but I don't think she feels it quite the same way. She's sure to be here tonight. Her parents are very old friends of mine. The father's not fully acceptable to some of the other old friends, but never mind that just now. Mustn't spread scandal. Clearly, she hasn't arrived yet. Clearly, Arthur Burby will be a perfect bear until she does. And after she arrives, moreover. A jealous. Oh, Lord, yes. He practically <laughs> persecutes the poor girl. Great pity she'll never marry him. She won't. Are you sure of that? Uh, tell me, 
what does she look like? I do have a reason for asking. You don't need to ask. Here she comes now, in the doorway with her mother. I'll introduce you directly. Let her answer for herself. Ha <laughs> ha! Burby's got there first. My dear Mrs. Beaumont! Oh, Major! Miss Charlotte, how well you are looking. Allow me to present my young friend, Mr. Linwood. Like myself, Miss Charlotte, he has been struck by the glorious simplicity, if I may so express myself, of your... Oh, dear me, I want words. In short, ma'am, of your accoutrement. <laughs> oh, I think Mr. Linwood wants words. <laughs> if he does, it is not for the simplicity of her dress, but its colour. Blue, pale blue and her dark hair, quite contrary to fashion, worn long all the way down her back. <laughs> I say, Arthur Burby, we are all good-humoured people here. What have you got on your eyebrows? It looks like a frown, me boy. It don't become you. Brush it away. I beg you to be so good, Major, as to mind Miss your Beaumont, own... Miss may I ask? Are you engaged for the next dance? Well, I... Miss Beaumont is engaged to me for the next dance. Oh, well, then, not... the third dance, Miss Beaumont. My dear, you are not bound to Captain Burvey, you know. Well, of course I'm not, Mama. It's just I don't want... Oh, why ever not? The third dance? But yes, with pleasure, Mr... Linwood? Yes, indeed, Lindwood. Percy Linwood, in fact. No, oh, Mr. Percy Linwood. <laughs> the Master of Ceremonies calls to the guests to pray, take your partners for the gavotte. Captain Burvey leads Miss Charlotte abruptly onto the floor without a word, without a smile. As they dance, her eyes are fixed upon nobody but Percy Linwood. <laughs> Without a word, without a smile, the abrupt Captain Burvey turns from his partner and strides down the length of the hall to the bandmaster. As a committee man, he has authority. He does not scruple to abuse it. Bandmaster, am I right? The next dance is a waltz? Quite right, sir, says the bandmaster. I do hope, sir, that it meets your approval. It certainly does not. Most unsuitable exercise for a young girl. For a very young girl. Exceedingly suggestive. You'll, you'll play something else. Miss Beaumont, are you marooned? What's happened to Burvey? And now that you have rescued me, I neither know nor care. <laughs> the Master of Ceremonies announces... Pray, take your partners for the waltz. Oh. Ah, Percy, you're in luck, me boy. A waltz, didn't I tell you? <laughs> oh, God, Burvey, watch where you're going. What the juice is the matter with you? It's a waltz, a damn waltz. Why the devil is it a waltz? I think because the colonel's wife has just had a word with the bandmaster. You know how she adores the waltz? Look at her there. <laughs> how she goes! By God, I've been vetoed. Mrs. Beaumont, you surely will not allow Charlotte, with a mere chance acquaintance, in the waltz. Oh, Ma, please. My dear, I'm not altogether sure. Oh, just once around the floor with her, Ma'am, if you're at all doubtful. Oh, well, very well. Just the once around, my dear, just as Mr. Linwood suggests. Oh, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> Just once around, ten times around, twenty, thirty. This was the first time she'd ever waltzed with a man. Oh, what a difference between the fervent clasp of Percy's arm and the cold, formal contact of the dancing mistress who taught her the steps. Occasionally, her bosom just touched him at those critical moments when she was in most need of support. At last... Overpowered by heat and fatigue. Oh. Oh. I'm very sorry. I, I simply can't dance oh, anymore. Lemonade, that's what you need. That's what they're serving somewhere. Take my arm. I'll go and search. And there and then at the refreshment bar, ghastly white with rage, the sudden face of Captain Burvey. Yes. 
He means to challenge him. They are going to fight a duel. As though blindly determined in the fury of jealousy to prove the quack prophet correct. In the meantime, their jealousy has prompted me to recall why I fixed this story so exactly in 1817. For of course, it is my father, 1817, the date of his first picture to be purchased by royalty, a milestone in his jealous little life. Lord, he never let us forget it. He consulted no prophet, and therefore did not foresee that I'd refuse to be the dapper little tuft hunter he desired. Indeed, I'd refuse almost all that had been held desirable by men like himself in 1817. High church religion, servile Tory politics, calculated and dynastic marriage... Even romantic marriage, I swore I'd accept nothing but brave, bare-faced honesty and no bloody humbug. <clears throat> Much the same as Percy Linwood. <laughs> Except that Percy Linwood is not always quite as honest as he'd like us to think him, perhaps. For example... He has tried to conceal from Charlotte Beaumore the truth about his quarrel with Burvey. Mr. Linwood, you were to have come down to Kent to pay us your first visit the day after the ball. So why have you kept us waiting for nearly a week? Miss Charlotte, I have counted the hours since we parted. Had I not been detained by business... I... Business, indeed. I don't believe one word of it. I think we should go into the summer house. Out of hearing, out of sight of anyone else in the garden. My mother, for example. Here. So, now you've no excuse for withholding what's kept you away from us. Mm. Just as I've no excuse for pretending I haven't noticed the patch of sticking plaster on your neck. A shaving cut, I assure you. Nothing at all. A razor. But she knows... She's read the newspaper. The duel was reported. The pistol bullet grazed his neck, missed his jugular by a hair's breadth. The report gave no names. A civilian, it said, and a captain of artillery in a wood near Woolwich Arsenal. <laughs> Mr Linwood, I made a guess, and I'm right. Am I not? <clears throat> oh, for shame. For shame! Even yet he evades the full truth. A ridiculous quarrel over a game of cards, that's all. Uh, though I'd risk my life again if I thought I would hear you speak as though you set some value on it. For indeed, he is deeply in love. The first true love of his life. And indeed, she knows it and shares it, and therefore, at length, she's able to extract the complete story. So it was, as I suspected, with Captain Burvey you were fighting. And in fact, you were fighting about me. And you nearly lost your life. And you refused to shoot back at him. How could I shoot back? Uh, to be sure, he was vile-tempered, but he had been your friend. Oh. Ah, and before he can stop her, she has seized his hand and kissed it. Why shouldn't I kiss the hand of a hero? Oh, I can't control myself when I hear of anything noble and good. Oh, you'll understand me better when we get to be old friends, won't you? Are we never to be nearer and dearer than old friends? Oh, Percy, I do hope so. Charlotte, where are you? Oh, it's my father. Back from town so soon. Uh, come and be introduced. Come. Already the first part of the prophecy is fulfilled, though Percy Linwood scarcely feels like a puppet of occult forces. He knows his love for Charlotte is thoroughly spontaneous, likewise vice versa, her love for him, and yet he tells her nothing about Dr. Lagarde. An instinct of caution, a colour of slyness, perhaps... For is she not fated to go away with Captain Burvey? Absolutely, he refuses to believe that that will happen. But now he must shake hands with her father. I'm honoured to meet you, sir. Is it not a most beautiful day? Beautiful, is it? No doubt. But how can anybody notice the beauty of the day in the face of this dreadful news from Parliament? Suspension of habeas corpus within less than a week. 
a bill to that effect and present it by ministers. And this, the official remedy for universal distress, despotism, Mr. Linwood, in a supposedly free country. The removal, Mr. Linwood, of an Englishman's most famous safeguard against arbitrary arrest and consignment without warrant to any dungeon, dungeon or Bastille. Dungeon or Bastille or unregulated torture pit at the disposal of the Home Secretary. Oh, Percy, is it not dreadful? And only too true. Father's correspondents are invariably reliable. Had I known, I'd have told you already. Would she? He wonders, he recollects Major Mulvaney talking about spies. He's suddenly aware that he's in the midst of radicals, the sort of people he's always associated with treasonable deceit. But associate Charlotte? No, the very thought... The very thought is abominable. If Charlotte and her father hold radical opinions... Ought I not revise my opinion of such opinions? But perhaps, Mr. Linwood, I weary you. You may not be interested in the conduct of government. Oh, no, sir. On the contrary, I have the strongest personal interest. Oh, have you? How? Government owes me a considerable sum of money due to my late father for his services overseas. Those peculating rogues have not released one penny of it. And I'm now in the process of petitioning the House of Commons. Fruitlessly, no doubt. Fruitlessly. Oh, yes, of course. Oh, of course. You can't defeat corruption all on your own. You need the help of politically experienced friends. I myself have some influence. I am entirely at your service. Uh, come to me tomorrow and we'll uh, talk over the details. For now, you must excuse me. Emergency meeting of the local branch of the John Hampden Democratic Club, of which I am vice president, to discuss the habeas corpus question and determine a strategy. A good day to you. A strategy. Resistance. No. All our friends say he ought to be in Parliament. Oh, Percy, dear, I do hope you like him. He stood for election twice, defeated each time. Expenses were dreadful. On a third attempt, he'd be sure to get in. But there's no money. We mustn't think of it. Percy Linwood's just beginning to consider the implications of Mr. Beaumont's lack of cash when along comes Mr. Beaumont's slovenly little manservant. Excuse me, miss, but Captain oh. Burvey's here. Says he's come to say goodbye to you and the mistress before he goes off on his leave, travelling the continent. I've put him in the parlour to wait for you, right? Oh, Percy, I won't see him. Percy, he wanted to kill you. <laughs> My dear, you are mistaken. He stood courageously to receive my fire, and then when I refused to fire, he fell upon his knees and thanked God for preserving my life from his own guilty hand. I assure you, we are now good friends. No, we are brothers. I beg you, be friends with him as I am. She's doubtful, but she agrees. Because she loves him, of course. And she bids her farewell to Captain Burvey with courteous composure, if not with very much warmth. At the same time, Captain Burvey contrives a short, private word with Percy Linwood. I'd be obliged if you'd offer me a lift in your carriage back to town. I've something important to say to you. His tone is so strange that Linwood feels bound to obey. Very well. Oh, Mr Linwood, do you leave us so soon? Can you not stay a little longer? Disappointment and surprise. And Charlotte seems to sniff what is almost an air of masculine conspiracy. Why, Percy, it's only three o'clock. But she does love him, of course, and therefore she must trust him, must she not? So she says nothing more, and off he goes in some perplexity. I confess myself perplexed, Burvey. What do you want to say to me? Did you notice Beaumont's flunky, new to the job? What did you think of him? Down at heel sort of fellow? Murky. Sidelong looks, crabwise walk. I wouldn't employ him. So, is this all that Captain Burvey has to say? Important? Or is this to be important another mile or two further on? Behind the beech trees on that hill, Linwood. Do you see the house there? What do you think of it? Well, it's a fine old house, to be sure. But why do I mention it? Because that's where my father lives. Chairman of the Bench of Magistrates. Has known Charlotte's father for years. I confide in him, he confides in me. May I confide in you? You don't answer. I take it I may. My duty as a friend, Linwood, 
is to warn you against Charlotte's father. Burby? What on earth? I, I do realise that Beaumont is, of course, a radical, but surely there's it's no need for It's not that he's to... a radical, though we all know how dangerous that is. No, he, he's an unprincipled radical. He needs money to get into Parliament, and I think he thinks that you have some. If he lands you as a result in political difficulties, he'll desert you without scruple. Desert his daughter, too. Think about it. What do you mean, unprincipled? His principles are obvious. In order to express them, he must stand for election. Expensive, of course. A man's principles always are. So they are, so they are indeed. Why don't we change the subject? My dear fellow, you never told me what it was that damned French prophet had to pronounce to you after I'd left. Percy Linwood, being more confident of Charlotte's affection than he is of Beaumont's honesty, feels suddenly quite spiteful toward Burvey, so he tells him in detail Dr. Lagarde's final vision, gleefully hoping to hurt him. Oh, the deuce. Oh, that hurts. Oh, Lord, how it hurts. You know and I know it's entirely impossible that I'd be able to persuade her to go away with me. No, no. Why, I'd go for another interview, except that he's left Villas Street. Nobody knows where he's gone to. I do admit I did try to find out, but no good. No good at all. No. So now Percy Linwood scarce dare speak to his beloved, lest he let slip a word of suspicion against her father. He dare not mention the French prophet. He dare not mention Captain Burvey. One little dishonesty after another. Yet what do they matter in the face of the huge dishonesty, unknown, unsuspected, invisibly pervading the house? The Beaumont's new servant is a government spy. He crouches in his attic bedroom. He scribbles at his secret reports. To the Home Office, Mr. Permanent Secretary Honoured Sir, to continue my account of the doings of the suspect... Beaumont and family. There's a young man, name of Linwood, a regular visitor well worth watching, in love with Miss Beaumont. He did seem to lack friendly feeling towards her father, which upset her, of course. But now Mr Beaumont's introduced him to the John Hamden Club and promised to do something for him, financial or political. Him and her are reconciled. She's wearing an engagement ring. She seemingly allows him to kiss her to her heart's content. And his next report after a week or two? Mr Linwood, every day, is in and out of that treasonable club with his grievance against Parliament. As I'm sure you're aware, Mr Permanent Secretary Honoured Sir, the hearing of his financial claim has been officially postponed. Mr. Beaumont is taking political advantage. He makes what he calls a campaign. He and Linwood are to lead a deputation to Parliament. Banners, brass bands, abusive placards, all of that. Clear contravention of the Seditious Meetings Act of 1795. I've no doubt it'll culminate in violence. I'm making this creature as nasty as I can. Egregiously disgraceful. His treacherous double life... Double life. What the deuce do I mean? Huge falsehoods only. The little ones don't count. <laughs> what about my life? Thirty years ago, I met another man's young concubine running in terror in her nightclothes the length of the Finchley Road. I rescued her there and then. I've lived with her ever since. Caroline, the woman in white. I named my best-known novel after her, told her I'd marry her. One of these days... But I didn't. Instead, I presented her to all the world as my housekeeper. Still, this bloody spy keeps writing to the Home Office. Honoured sir, upon receipt of your official letter, I waited upon Mr Justice Burvey to inform him I was instructed to arrest Mr Beaumont and Mr Linwood, for which he had to give me a warrant. But I do not trust his loyalty... He insisted upon delaying the date of the warrant, some smart legal formula about no criminal intent having as yet been proved beyond uncorroborated hearsay. His son, the artillery captain, has now returned from overseas and is visited today by a Major Mulvaney. 
King's officers or not, I wouldn't trust either of them. Of course he's quite right. Indeed, they should not be trusted. Do you tell me, Mulvaney, my misguided father has broken government secrecy to tell you that he's issued this warrant, and without a single word of it to me? I assure you he's told nobody. I obtained my information from, not so very far from, Whitehall. You know how I know all manner of men about town. What I do not know is who the deuce is the local scoundrel who's been laying the information. Oh, but I think I know. It's that manservant. They've given themselves the right to insert their damned agents into a gentleman's household. Intolerable. But nobody's been arrested yet. Ah, no, for don't you see... The warrant is post-dated. Your misguided father has surely had his wits about him, devious old devil. He knows that I know more than I'm supposed to know. By God, he expects me to use the delay to discover a way of escape. Escape? You mean Linwood? Help him to go on the run? Bungor as well, I suppose. But... Always my father's been so conscientious. I, I didn't believe he Way ever... of escape for his magistrate's conscience, I meant. But indeed, arising out of it. Wish to God that stupid Beaumont wasn't quite so stupid and stubborn. The point is, how long have we got? If only we knew the date on the warrant. Oh, but we do know it. It cannot be later than tomorrow. Beaumont and Linwood have announced their tomfool protest march for tomorrow afternoon in London. First thing tomorrow, they'll be thrown in jail. And when I think how my dear Charlotte... Uh, you I'm say your no dear Charlotte, but Burvish is not your dear Charlotte. She's Linwood's. By God, sir, that's the answer. What do you mean? Listen to I'm... me and keep your mouth shut. I am perceiving already the rudiments of a decisive plan. For the last 24 hours, the spy has been buzzing like a wasp in a bandbox, dispatching his messages hither and thither, under pretense of running errands for the house. Hear him as he jabs his rancid pen yet again into the ink. Honoured sir, in the course of this evening, Beaumont and Linwood will be off to the Hampton Club to make arrangements for tomorrow. The Bow Street officers sent down here to execute the warrant will arrest them after breakfast, just so soon as they're observed to foregather with Confederates for their conspiratorial journey to London. Thus, any disaffection in consequence of the arrest will be kept here in the countryside, well clear of metropolitan contingencies. Now for the first test of Major Mulvaney's decisive plan. Can Captain Burvey persuade two headstrong gentlemen to be bundled out of their own country like a... Like a pair of insolvent stock jobbers? I have never in my life heard anything so demeaning. I am astonished at you, Burvey. For the last time, Mr. Beaumont, will you understand you're in danger? And you, my dear Linwood, equally that? in danger unless you both leave here tonight. Captain Burvey, as the people's devoted friend, I scorn to take flight from the empty threats of tyrants. Good God, they dare not touch me. Do you not comprehend the strength of my popular fame? <laughs> I'm going indoors for a glass of brandy. Uh, Linwood, uh, do you come? Yes, why not? Uh, one moment, Linwood. What? I do know your reasons for adopting your radical politics. First for money, <laughs> then for love. And now I do believe you're a, well, a, a believer. I'm almost one myself when I realise the foul tricks that government nowadays plays. But do, for heaven's sake, make use of your own good sense. Accept, if you must, the revolutionary ideal. But never accept this lunatic Beaumont as a living example. If you hope indeed to become Charlotte's husband, consult your own safety. I can arrange for your passage to France. Ned, I am sure what you say is most generously intended. But have you forgotten that when Charlotte is my wife, her father will be my father? He is moreover my friend. And the members of his club are my friends. Oh, that they've it... taken up my claim and made it their own. Do you think I'd be so base as to forsake them? Oh! oh. <laughs> to which Captain Burvey has no answer at all, save to turn upon his heel. Out of the garden and along the road, his hands aloft to heaven in furious disgust. When he reaches the village street, he finds Major Mulvaney waiting for him. The Major shows no sign of surprise. I see that they gave you a damn dusty answer. Good. So we know what to do. We do, but I don't want to. 
If it scares her, if it repels her, how can we hope to succeed? Oh, do catch hold of yourself. Horses, in behind the corner here. Don't let them get a sight of you. Beaumore and Ninwood off to their club. Good. The sun's in my eyes. I can't see what Beaumore's wearing. It's not his great cape riding coat, nor that cap with the ear flaps. Good. As I predicted, the weather is far too warm. Now, time for your move. Back to the house, talk to the girl directly. Don't let the mother impede you. If I say I'll do something, by God, sir, I'd do it. It's just I'd rather not, that's all. When I thought she might love me, I behaved like a brute to her. And now that I know that you don't, I'm... On your I... way! Yes, yes, I'm on my way. Charlotte? Charlotte, who is that you're talking to over the fence? Charlotte, will you please come into the house? Yes, Mama, coming. Mama, this is most extraordinary, but I was... Captain Burvey, is it not? And he is still there waiting for you. What does he want? He knows you do not welcome Indeed, him. Indeed, I do not, Mama. But he insists he must see me in private on a matter of serious importance to all of us, he says. Mama, his face, his voice are tragical. Mama is alarmed, but she's deeply curious, too. She concedes Captain Burvey an unsupervised talk with Charlotte on the steps of the front door no longer than five minutes. You tell me Mr. Linwood has made me the subject of his discourse with a soothsayer, and this is your excuse for your your grotesque proposition that I should agree to... Shh, please! Do not realise it is irrefutably foretold and nobody can prevent it. Miss Beaumont, it is bound to happen. The trick is to make it happen in the way that we choose. Captain Burvey, if I should agree to... to run away with you... Good heavens! You expect that Mr Linwood and my father will immediately chase after us and thereby escape their peril, if indeed there is a peril. Oh, yes, there is. I give my word as a Christian gentleman. Or would you not accept the word of a justice of the peace? Let me bring you directly to talk to my own father. I'm sure I could prevail upon him to tell you the full story. Oh, heaven. It is far too dangerous. If anything goes wrong, you and Percy could kill each other before I could stop you. Yet how else to get either of them, my father and my beloved, arrogant, stupid, heroic, sentimental noodles, how else do we get them to move? Because otherwise, what? Transported to New South Wales or even... Oh, God help us, they could be hanged! Captain Burvey, I no longer like you. I don't think I ever did like you. Always I have felt you were excitable, self-centred, untrustworthy, and now it would seem degradingly superstitious. And yet, and yet, yet what can I do but trust you? Shh, shh, your mother. Well, what is my daughter to trust you? I do not trust you an inch. Charlotte, what is this about? I must go, Mama, at once with the captain to his father. Do not be afraid. I'm aware of what I'm doing. His father? The magistrate? But your father has always refused any dealings Quite with him. Quite correct, Mum. So he has. Miss Beaumont, no more nonsense. Off we go! <gasps> oh! Come in with me! He has suddenly tight hold of Charlotte as though he were a brigand abducting her. He hurtles her across the garden, out of the gate, out of sight in less than a minute. In a dreadful uneasiness, the good lady retreats to her parlour and waits till she can wait no longer. Should she not send the manservant to the magistrate's house to make certain that all is well, to make certain that... But where is the manservant? You may be sure he's not where he should be. He's aloft yet again in his treacherous attic. Thomas! Where are you, Thomas? Where can that young man have got to? He has never given satisfaction, never since he came under this roof. Thomas! He hears her, thinks he ought, perhaps for the last time, to show willing, slip quietly down the stairs as though he'd never been upstairs and sees in the front hall what Mrs. Beaumore from the parlour door is staring at in total astonishment. Oh, my goodness gracious, Mr. Beaumore, what are you doing? For the figure of her husband swathed in his great riding coat with his travelling cap on his head without a word or one glance toward her is dodging across the hall and out at the front door and slam it goes behind him and down comes that flunky down the last flight of stairs through the door to the garden after him. Outside in the road is a post-chaise. Mr. Beaumont jumps into it. The postillion whips up the horses. The flunky amazingly flings himself at the back of the chaise, up onto the luggage board, and they're off hell for leather on the road to London. My husband to London? 
The day before he said he'd go. It'll be dark before he gets there. And why has the servant gone after him? So when, after an hour or so, her husband comes on horseback from his club and Percy Linwood with him as though nothing whatever has happened, well... I know nothing of any post-chaise, madam, <laughs> but I do know a political attempt when I see one to strike at me through the life of my child. <laughs> this damnable aristo of a jacking office magistrate has taken her hostage. No, sir, not the magistrate. His vindictive, perfidious son, who believes himself... Oh, God, how I see it so clearly... Believes himself predestined to have her. Mr. Beaumont, be assured I shall... Assurances at once cut short by the arrival of a boy with a letter from the house of the magistrate, addressed to Charlotte's mother in Charlotte's own handwriting. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Dearest Mama, says the letter, I am desperately, desperately sorry for all the trouble I must cause you. I can't explain anything yet except, dear Mama, I am deeply and wonderfully in love, and when we get to Paris, I'll write to you properly. Paris? Does she think, does he think that I am not capable of pursuit as far as Paris? No. If need be to Constantinople. All she says at the end is, please to tell dear Percy he must forgive me, but... That's how she finishes, but... The writing tales away all smudged with her tears. She hasn't even signed it. Beaumont, do you come with me, or do you leave me to go alone? Um, if I come with you, I'm effectively prevented from marching for our liberties in London, compelled into exile, and yet... Ah, yes, I have it. An announcement in the public press. Direct quote. I am not Brutus. I am only Beaumont. My daughter before everything. My speech to be read at the meeting by Secretary Joskin of the club. A copy of the speech is in my desk. Mrs. Beaumont sent it to Joskin at once and tell him for God's sake not to drop his voice at the ends of the sentences. So, to the red line. We scrawl a short note to the newspaper, order a post chaise and away. Events that are foredoomed are not necessarily sinister, so let's have a happy ending. It begins with another letter sent to Mrs. Beaumont, this time from Major Mulvaney. Dear lady, please forgive me a most hurtful, deceitful stratagem, but it saved Mr. Beaumont's life. It was myself in his coat and cap. That blackguard of a manservant believed I was your husband making his escape, so of course he had to cling to me. All the way to London he clung in hideous discomfort, and only in London did he discover his error. The fugitives, meanwhile, being well on their way to Paris, and... And in Paris they do not have to search for Captain Burvey. He astonishingly sends a messenger to meet them at the stagecoach depot and direct them to his hotel, where they storm into his private room. What have you done with my daughter, you... you villain, you... She's just idiot. behind that door, sir. Daughter. Don't distress her with your noise. Say what you have to say quietly. Mr. Linwood, apparently, has come here with nothing to say. Pistols in my travelling bag and bullets in my pistol, and they shall do the talking. Fair enough. I have insulted you. I've outrageously presumed to make an alteration in your wedding arrangements. The chaplain of the British Embassy will be ready for you first thing in the morning. We don't have to tell him we're on the run from the Bow Street Runners. On the run? We? Who the devil do you mean, we? All of us, my dearest. Oh, Charlotte. We're a parcel of felons. You and Father, because you are, and Captain Burvey and myself, because we've aided and abetted. Aided and abetted and... Wedding? Burvey, you said wedding. Oh, my darling Charlotte, can I really have been such a blockhead? All at once I do believe I can see what has happened. Uh, I am not a blockhead, sir. I, I don't see it at all, sir. No. Explain yourselves. Oh, Barbie, I do believe you're the case. best friend a man ever had. I've no doubt you remember the day you spared my life. Very much against my will. It laid me under an obligation. Well, sir, there you are. There. True love and warm forgiveness and the feeble collapse of inept revolution, a cosy endorsement of 1817 and its mean-spirited complacency which so suited my father and might well have suited me had I not been courageous enough to... Oh, God, do I dare to call myself courageous? Caroline? Oh... My God, twelve years after I met her, who should I meet but Martha? I've lived with Martha ever since. I've lived with Caroline ever since. 
Martha's given birth to my children. Caroline hasn't. Well, do you suppose I've been able to balance the arrangement without ever telling vile little lies to either of them? Oh, God, let the drug grant me just one more vision, benevolent vision, please. Like what happened to Dr. Lagarde? Who saw him die? Captain Bervé, no less. Once again, I was in Paris. 1830. Revolution in the streets. I offered my military skill to the popular uprising. I saw a dead man sprawled across a barricade. His comrade beside him turned to me and said, The courageous physician, the best friend the people ever had, shot dead while he bound the wounds of friend and enemy alike. And I'd thought, years before, he might have been a dirty spy. I misinterpreted his prophecy. I misinterpreted him. Always, all of our lives, such ludicrous mistakes. Ludicrous mistakes to the very end of our lives, and all we can do is try to correct them, if only by dragging them up from our memories in whatever form they choose to come to the very end of my life. So, of course, I keep making these stories over and over again. Every one of them. A vision of a ludicrous mistake. In Mr. Percy and the Prophet by Wilkie Collins, Collins was played by Ronald Pickup, Percy Lindwood, Jonathan Firth, Captain Burvey, Mark Payton, and Charlotte Beaumont, Tilly Gaunt. Mr. Beaumont was Michael Cochran, Mrs. Beaumont, Francis Jeter, Major Mulvaney, Norman Rodway, Dr. Lagarde, Gareth Armstrong, and Beaumont's manservant, Harry Myers. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The pianist was Peter Ringrose. Mr. Percy and the Prophet was adapted for radio by John Arden and directed by Rosalind Ward. <laughs>